Hi everyone, I'm James. Um, I make it about 20 past 12, which means that you're all about a third of the way through your waking day, which also means that you've made at least 10,000 decisions today already. Maybe like me, you've woken up and chosen to press the snooze button, and again, and again, and again. You've chosen what to eat for breakfast, You've chosen to brush your teeth. You've chosen to put clothes on. Good for you. You've chosen to hop on the bus, hop on your bike, hop in the car, and come down to this talk today. Whatever we do, we're always, always choosing. Even when we're not choosing, we're choosing not to choose. I'm a, I'm a consumer psychologist, and I've chosen to look at the world through people's brains and through people's baskets. to understand how and why they're making choices. Now, we're making choices all the time, but we're not, we're not always very good at it. There's lots of different things that impact the way in which we make choices. If I'm hungry, I make bad choices. Have you ever been to the supermarket hungry? You come back with things you've never even heard of. When you, when you need a wee, you make really good choices. They're more accurate, more prompt. When you lean to the left, when you make choices, you underestimate size. Weird, right? Um, so yeah, my objective is to choose, or is to find out why people choose to tango or not to tango. Um, so, uh, supermarkets, that's my area of expertise. There's somewhere between 10,000 and 50,000 different choice permutations in one of those places. That's an awful lot. Now, we're not making all of those choices all of the time, but it's quite easy to leave a supermarket and feel exhausted by the experience. So a lot of the time, we kind of fall into this pattern of going onto autopilot. We're like zombies navigating aisles in the supermarket, walking past these cliff faces of products and choices. So what exactly is happening when we switch off? What is the brain doing when we switch off? Should we trust the brain? I think it's a valuable question to ask because our brain isn't even telling us about the noses in front of our face. You can try it yourself. If you close one eye, you can see your nose, but open both eyes again and it reappears. The brain is kind of airbrushing it out. So what else is the brain airbrushing out? So Obama trying to look at his nose. Um, what, yeah, what else is the brain not telling us about how we're making choices? To continue the, the dance analogy, it's often the case that we're not leading the way we make choices. We're being led by our environments. We're constantly looking for signs and signals in our environments to give us clues and indications as to what we should do. And a lot of this context is kind of guiding and determining what decisions we make. Uh, so in the next 10 minutes or so, I wanna give you or run through four or so examples of how context determines what we choose. Three cans of Tango. Tango in the supermarket is on offer, 50% off. That's a great deal, it's a no brainer, right? I'm going to choose one. But accompanying that offer is a small note that reads, maximum uh, items per customer, three. And you tend to find people, especially on larger shops, picking up three. When that same note reads, maximum items per customer, five, you tend to find people picking up five items. So is it you that's choosing one? Or is it you that's choosing three? Or is it you that's choosing five? Or is it your context? Let's look at the context of price as well. We have option A and option B here. Option A is £1.80 and option B is £2.20. Generally, we tend to rely on our price schema to determine what we choose. You know, the higher the price, the higher the quality. It's an easy choice. But what happens when we 
add a third choice into the mix, Fanta. If we add that in here at £1.60, then the majority of people, instead of choosing Tango, now choose Rubicon. 80% when there were two choices chose Tango, now 80% are choosing the Rubicon. What happens when we mix that up again and add the Fanta into the options set at £3.60? Now we find that 90% of people are choosing the Tango. So does it take two to Tango or does it take three to Tango? What about when there's more than three choices? What about when there's 24 choices or six choices? Choice in the West we associate with our sense of freedom. Our ability to choose is directly related to our sense of freedom, right? So choice must be a good thing. 24 choices you find in a supermarket when there are 24 choices, 60% of people will approach, engage, and learn about the, the variety of products you have there. When there's just six, only 40% of people approach, learn, engage. So choice is a good thing, right? Not necessarily so. When you have these 24 choices, only 4% of people end up actually making a decision making a choice. When you have six choices, 45% of people end up taking something at home, home with them. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. Two choices. Let's keep it simple. Just because there are two choices next to one another on a supermarket shelf, does that necessarily mean that we're deciding between these two options? Fizzy drink A and fizzy drink B. Chocolate bar A or chocolate bar B. These two are on shelf next to one another. But I'm choosing the Mars bar because it's an indulgence. It's a treat. So it might be compared and competing with, for instance, a bottle of wine. Whereas the Snickers, on the other hand, it's got nuts. It's functional. It's fuel for my body. So I might be comparing that with a ham sandwich, for instance. Just because the two are sat next to one another on shelf in the same context doesn't necessarily mean that I'm choosing between them. Now, I've chosen to keep my talk short and sweet so we can move on to more important things like lunch. But I would like to conclude uh, by saying that despite having loads of practice at choosing and despite attaching a large part of our identity to choosing, we're not very good at it. In fact, a lot of the time, we're not even doing it ourselves. It's the context around us that's been formed for us that's influencing those decisions. And so one piece of advice before you go is that when you're in the supermarket, just check every once in a while whether you can see your nose in front of your face. That's me, thank you. Thank you.